The text of the proclamation of the Lord's word is summed up in the last verse of our reading, which reads, And the king was deeply moved and went up to the chamber over the gate and wept. And as he went, he said, O oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, would I had died instead of you, O oh, Absalom, my son, my son. <clears throat> Beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, <clears throat> what a bitter cry King David makes here in our text. O oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, would I had died instead of you, O oh, Absalom, my son, my son. Does that cry touch your heart? It certainly touches my heart. As a father in Israel, having raised children of our own together with my wife, how can any father and mother not sense that deep pain and sorrow in this bitter cry? Having also raised children of their own, having then experienced not only the joy and delights that come with child rearing, but also the pain and the sorrow and the grief that sometimes comes with it too. Perhaps you're one of them. Perhaps hearing this cry of David, maybe it is as a sword in your own heart, as you also cry out because of loss of one of your children. Perhaps through quite some different circumstances, Perhaps it was a physical death due to a health issue or, or some foolishness. Or worse yet, a, a spiritual death. Or the fear thereof, seeing there's waywardness or a backsliding trend. How we then cry out to the Lord in pain. How we then grieve in the, the bitterness of our heart. Well, brothers and sisters, if you are one of them, you are not alone. No. In fact, it can be safely said that there's hardly a father or a mother who has not shared that grief at one time or another to a greater or smaller degree in the raising of their children. For indeed, our children can sometimes be so wonderful, but sometimes they can also be very difficult. So you are not alone. Others share that grief with you you're not alone, not only because others share that grief with you, but also because your Heavenly Father shares your grief. And also very personally understands your grief, for He offered up His one and only Son on that bitter and shameful cross. No, not because He was so wayward and so rebellious. No, because you and I were rebellious. You and I were wayward. But therefore, brothers and sisters, in the midst of our grief, we may now have hope and we may now receive comfort and strength in our time of need. And so I may proclaim to you the word of God this afternoon as follows. The grief of a parent can only be covered in Christ. And we'll see from David, we can learn first that there's deep love despite much grief. Secondly, there's failure despite successes. And thirdly, there's victory despite hopelessness. So first of all, the grief of a parent could only be covered in Christ. From King David, we learn that there's deep love despite much grief. Yes, what parent does not love their sons and daughters? So your son and daughter, they can hurt you so much at times, they can embarrass you terribly, and yet you can't help but love them, right? They can be disobedient and rebellious, and they, yet you feel drawn to them. You love them too much to let them go. They may even leave you for a time or forever, but you can't forget them. You still love them. They're still your flesh and blood. They can also cost you a lot of money. You may need to build them out from this or from that, and this trouble or that trouble. They may hurt you bitterly, and yet you still continue to love them dearly. You would do anything for them, so to speak. Indeed, the words of Isaiah are so true. Can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? That love is true for a mother, but it is no less true for a father. 
David also experienced such grief in his life. We don't hear too much about David's wife or wives. They too must have grieved bitterly over the loss of their sons. But all focus is here on David. As David is a father in Israel, as a father of a household, who is to give godly examples and godly teachings to his children, particularly to his sons, who would eventually also become fathers of households. That third commandment must have laid heavy on David's heart as he strove to to raise his children in the fear and honor of the Lord. David knew the commandments very well. He knew that the sins of the fathers would be carried through the third and the fourth generation of those who hate him. That means those who, who rebelled against him, particularly with deliberate sin. But brothers and sisters, we as fathers and mothers, and would be fathers and mothers, the Lord willing, should not only associate ourselves with David's grief, but also must put David's grief in perspective of the whole of David's life. That is, not only David's life of sin, but also David's life of worship and David's trust in the Lord his God. Now David must have frequently reflected on his own sin in his life, particularly sin of adultery and murder and the consequences thereof. This is also deep sin in our lives. There's also sin in our lives. And the consequence of some of our sins do follow us. And sin sometimes causes us also to lose perspective where our first love ought to be and how our love should be applied. David struggled with that too. How often does not a child who causes us the most grief get the most attention and love? And that can have a detrimental effect on the other children. David too had other children. But we do not hear too much about his love for them, other than later his love for Solomon. But almost from the beginning of Absalom's teenage years, we may say that David had a special attraction for Absalom. With the result that he often gave into Absalom far too quickly. But a better judgment would have been a better response. But David lost perspective because of somewhat twisted love for his son Absalom. He appeared to love his son Absalom more than all the rest of his sons and also at all costs. He was even willing to flee from his son. All the while, his son Absalom had not done him much good, had not built up King David's reputation as a father in Israel. First, Absalom manipulated his father, King David, in forcing Amnon, David's oldest son, to attend a celebration associated with the shearing of Absalom's sheep. And at this festival meal, Absalom got his half-brother Amnon drunk and then ordered his servants to, to murder Amnon in revenge for raping his sister Tamar. Absalom went then into self-imposed exile. He fled from the royal household from, in Jerusalem and stayed for three years with his grandfather, Tamai, king of Geshur. David mourned for the death of his son, Amnon, despite Amnon's sin against Tamar. Amnon was his oldest brother, his oldest son. Amnon was his oldest son, and thus the heir to the throne. Nevertheless, it was not long before David also longed for Absalom again. It took two years and then David faced Absalom face to face once again. And when he did so, he gave Absalom a kiss. Now you would think that such a son would have learned a lesson or two in taking things in his own hands. But that was not the case. Once Absalom regained his previous status in David's household, he began to take steps to replace his father as king in Israel. Acquiring horses and a chariot and a private militia, Absalom began positioning himself to become David's replacement as the highest legal authority in Israel. He continually undermined his father's goodwill. He acted like a true politician attempting to run for office. And his efforts paid off. It appeared that his good looks also did him a lot of good. Eventually he became more popular than his father. And so after winning the favor of the people of Israel, Absalom decided now was the time to fulfill his ambition by proclaiming himself king of Israel. When David learned of this, note what David said 
Come, we must flee, or none of us will escape it from Absalom. David knew Absalom's murderous intent, that none, not even himself, Absalom's father, would escape Absalom's sword. And yet, David loved his son. And so he was not going to fight his son in the city. That would be disastrous. And so David and his men fled into the forest near Mahanaim. You see, David was a trained soldier and a skilled war strategist. In Mahanaim, David received the provisions for his people. He was able to organize his troops as well for battle. Quite a company appeared to follow David. And so he appointed commanders of thousands and commanders of hundreds and set over them three generals, Joab, Abishai, and Etai. And then the king said, I myself also will go out with you. But here we see how the people loved David. But they would not let David go out to battle with them. Not this time, for they knew that his son Absalom was out to get David. David alone was Absalom's target. Therefore, in a respectful way, they said to the king, You shall not go out. It is better for you to send help from the city. And David complied. But as the troops were about to go to war on behalf of the king, David had some final words for them. And it was not the usual pep talk with all the hype of, and focus on victory. No, David's charge was quite different. David said, Do you gently for my sake with the young man Absalom. David said this personally to each general as they walked by him. So as Job and his men walked by King David, David shouted out to them, Be gent deal gently with, for my sake with the young man Absalom. And all Job's men heard this. And then Abishai walked by with all his men, and Job, uh, David shouted out again, Deal gently for my sake with the young man Absalom. And all Abishai's men walked by. All Abishai's men heard it. So also with the Etai and his men. Everyone heard these words. Do you gently for my sake with the young man Absalom. But do you see here, brothers and sisters? Here is not a concern for the people of Israel. Here is not a concern for the church, you could say but only for his one son, his wayward son. How many people would die because of David's one son? And yet David was not concerned for all those who would die in Israel, but he was only concerned for his one son, his rebellious son, his wayward son, Absalom. How different that was from the advice Ahithophel gave to Absalom. I thought Phil intended, intent was only to kill David and let all the other people of Israel live. Yet David allowed his men to kill any other Israelite, but not his son, the leader of the revolution. What love David had for his son. But was that not a twisted love? Yes, how easy it is to have a twisted love in desperation to love our children despite their mistakes, their rebellion, and their sin. 20,000 soldiers, 20,000 soldiers would die that day in battlefield. Should that not have given David a lot of grief? But no, David had little concern for the many who would die for the sake of his son's sin. He only had concern for the one son whom he loved so dearly that he would ever offer up the lives of many for his one son. Yes, there's much grief in this, isn't there? But David's deep yet twisted love would only bring greater grief. And so we come to the second point. There is failure despite successes. Indeed, if you look at the life, the whole life of David, David had been very successful in most things he had done. That began already very early in his life as a young man in his father's house, in Jesse's house, he attended his father's sheep, and he did that very well. The Lord was with him. The Lord allowed him to fight a bear at one time, and another time a lion, in order to protect his father's sheep. And one day David came face to face with a giant of a man named Goliath. And in the fear of the Lord, David was fearless 
He won the battle of the Lord by conquering over this giant and blasphemer of God, not with a sword and a spear, but with a sling and a stone. Yes, David had also been successful as a magician. He was renowned for his harp playing. He could soothe the troubling spirit of King Saul. Later, David set up the temple worship, where he produced many of the psalms that we still sing today, giving glory to God, even through our difficult times at times. David, too, had been successful as a soldier and a general. During David's time, the borders of Israel expanded as never before. Honoring the blessings of the Lord, David had brought in what became known as the golden age of King David and Solomon. The kingdom of David became the envy of many kings after him, even a a symbol of restoration of Israel. Also disciples of the Lord Jesus, just before the Lord Jesus was taken up to heaven, asked him about the restoration of Israel. Such it was on the mind of Jews, of Israel. David had been successful as an administrator. He had been successful as a politician. But brothers and sisters, for all the wonderful successes that David enjoyed, David failed in his first and primary responsibility. And you know what that is now, right? He failed as a father. David failed as a father. That outweighed all his successes. And you can hear that in David's lament, Oh, my son, Absalom, my son, my son, Absalom, would I had died instead of you? Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. David was willing to take off his crown and completely empty himself of all his glory, his renown and successes. If only he could have this on his conscience that he had been a good father to his son. Please hear this, young brothers, young fathers, middle-aged fathers, while the child rearing leaders are yet before you, lest you too end up grieving as David grieved. Because brothers, there is no success in business, in sports, or whatever you may be successful in in this world that compares to the success of having been a good father or mother as far as that goes. That is, of having been there for our sons and daughters. Having been there to teach them the wonderful things of the Lord. Having been there to pray with them and, and for them. Teach them how to pray. Having been there to lay godly examples, the godly walk and the godly talk on their young lives. Sure, you can only succeed under the blessings of the Lord. But you yourself must strive in covenant faithfulness and covenant obedience. How many among us today are not grieving? I wish they could do it all over again. How many among us are lamenting today that you spent too much time in your business, in your work, too much time having fun with the fellows at work or at sport, and too little time with your children? You left that to your wife. How many are regretting today as moms that you were not there for your children when they came home from school. Francis, if the world would tell us that much of teenage rebellion is the result of dysfunctional families, also because mom and dad are too busy with each other's own affairs, should that not concern us? Should that not make us aware that we need to be there for our children? Even more so because of our covenant responsibility that we vowed before the Lord at the baptismal fund? Yes, some parents were too permissive in their child rearing. They let the children make the laws for themselves, and, and often that did not include God's will and word. Others were too authoritarian, so that they implemented the doctrine of the word of God, but without love and compassion, giving the reason why. With the result that the child grew up and said, Goodbye, Mom and Dad. If this is what the love of God is all about, I want nothing of it. So he left the faith. But the parent was a noisy gong and a clanging cymbal. Yes, by the grace of God, thankfully, some of our children learned to deal with the weaknesses of the parents. But for others, it was too much. And so they left the faith. True, ultimately, the faith of our children is not in our hands. Yet the Lord does use us 
as his instruments to raise up our children, his children, to fear him, to love him, to honor him. Because how many of us are not grieving because of one or other of these realities in our household? David, too, grieved bitterly. Once again, David would have taken off his crown. He would have emptied himself of all his glory, renown, and successes. If only he could have on this conscience that he had been a good father to his son. Brothers and sisters, there's no treasure so great than to know that you were successful as a father and mother, of course, under the blessings of the Lord. And there's no treasure so great than to have a clear conscience that you gave your best effort, time, and energy in the raising of your children. And brothers, that is all that the Lord requires of us as parents. Contrary, there's no misery so great than to realize that you failed as a father and mother. And that, that is particularly because of a certain sin or weakness in your personal life, which you knew about, but you refused to correct. Was it greed? Was it materialism? Was it worldlyism? Was it a particular God in your life? Sport, power, achievement, certain entertainment, maybe a certain person? Our sister David knew from where his troubles came. But the Lord told him through the prophet Nathan. And then the Lord pointed out to David and said, Now therefore the sword will never depart from your house, because you have despised me. And I've taken the wife of Uriah, the Hittite, to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against you out of your own house. The brother says, isn't it ironic that it would be Joab who would kill Absalom? For it was Joab who had organized amnesty for Absalom in the first place and brought him back to Jerusalem. And it was Joab who obtained greater freedom for Absalom and brought him back into the king's presence. But it was also Joab who, under the order of King David, had Uriah killed in battle without raising a word of protest to the king. And now this military commander who would kill a righteous man, Uriah, at David's request, now killed David's own son, Absalom, in direct violation to David's request. There is a saying that, that says, what goes around comes around. That seems to fit here a bit, doesn't it? David, who abused his almost absolute authority, and so took Uriah's wife, and then Uriah's life is now powerless to save his own son from death at the hand of Joab. Joab knew that King David had broken the laws of the Lord because he followed his own desires of adultery and murder, and so he could hardly call Joab to account. So at this point, Joab only did what was best for all of Israel, and not for King David. Joab was weary with the troubles that Absalom had caused for the king and for all Israel, and so he had Absalom put to death. And David couldn't touch him, because David knew he was guilty himself. Yes, what misery our sin can bring upon us. How often do we not struggle with our own sins and shortcomings? Yes, our own sins and weaknesses make sometimes the child-rearing of our children sometimes very difficult. And how often do we see ourselves in our children? How we are often reminded of our own weaknesses and sins and shortcomings through our children. We can therefore grow weary and we can give up and we can give in and throw our hands up in the air and say, in sense of hopelessness. And there is also so much grief and sorrow in our hearts when we do see our children not walking in the ways of the Lord. And yet we continue to love them. We can't forget them. David continued to love Absalom despite Absalom's grievous sins against God and against the king and despite Absalom hurting him so bitterly. Because of his deep love for his son Absalom, David cried bitterly when he hears of Absalom's death. Oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, would I had died instead of you, O oh, Absalom, my son, my son. The brothers and sisters, there's victory despite hopelessness. It brings us to the last point. 
Indeed, with Absalom's death, the battle is done. The battle's over. But isn't it striking how the Lord saw to it that Absalom would die that day, regardless if Job and his armor bearers did not kill Absalom? Where it appeared that left to himself, Absalom would have been another one of those whose life would have been claimed by the forest. For God saw to it that Absalom's head got caught in a tree. And so, left dangling there long enough, he would certainly have come to his death. But it was Job and his men who killed Absalom. There was a message in this for King David. That Job was the one who in the end killed Absalom. In later days, David could see, when David could see things more clearly, he would realize that in this, his own sin came upon his own head. But for the moment, he was too captivated in his twisted love for his son. He only had his one son in mind. Absalom alone had David's full attention and love. Now you can imagine that for the army of David, it was a great victory. For Absalom's army was also not very small. And you can imagine as this victorious army was returning from, to the city of Mahanaim, they would be singing songs of joy, of songs of victory, until they came up to the city gate of Mahanaim. Song stopped, but the king was not there to greet them. And that was because King David had heard about the death of a son. After the defeat of Absalom's army, with the death of, of, of Absalom, Ahimaeus, the son of Sadok, begged Job to be the one who could bring the good news to David. Now Job knew that this would not be good news for the king, although it would be for everyone else. Job knew too that Ahimaeus was a friend of the king, and therefore if the king would see him coming, the king would see this indeed as good news. And so you see here that Job considered, had, took his, his king into consideration, was gentle with the, his king. And so he forbade Ahimaeus to run to Mahanaim. Job sent the Cushite instead. However, Ahimaeus persisted, and so finally Job relented and let him run to carry the good news to David as well. And be, but being highly motivated and being a, a better runner and choosing a faster route, Ahimaeus actually managed to arrive at Mahanaim before the Cushite. Now, as a concerned father, David stood by the gate, scanning the horizon continually, anxiously waiting for good news. No, not whether the battle was successful, but whether his son was still alive. We notice that in the questions he asked the runners, right? Is my son still alive? And indeed, three times David received what seemed to be good news. Further, there's that single runner, and that is interpreted to be the bearer of good news. And then the watchman sees another single runner, and David then interprets that again as good news. And then the watchman told David that the first runner was Ahimaeus, and David, that's David's friend. And so there was a third confirmation that the news must be good. That's what a slap in the face it was for the king when he finally learned that his son was dead. He was overcome with grief. He was overcome by his emotions. His heart was wrenched in pain. And going up to his upper room, he cried out in the bitterness of his heart, Oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, would I had died instead of you? Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. David expressed here that he wished he could have died in his son's place. This would not only have been because of his great love for his son, but also because of his knowledge that he was the cause of his son's death. For brother said, this is now the third son that died. First, there was that baby conceived in adultery. Then there was Amnon, and now Absalom. How much can a man take? How much sorrow and misery can a father and mother take to see not one, but more of their children going astray or die? And yet there would be one more son of David who would die in later years, Adonijah, who strove to receive the royal inheritance alongside of Solomon. Four times 
David stood at the graveside of one of his sons, with tears coming down his eyes, his heart wrenched in pain, his soul overwhelmed with pain, crying out, Oh, my son, my son, it was I. It was I who caused you your death. It was I by my sin who caused you this misery. So understandably, not only out of his deep love for Absalom, but also out of his deep sense of guilt, of being the guilty one who brought this misery into his household, caused David to wish that he would have died instead of Absalom. And yet, brothers and sisters, the main message of this text is not on misery, which we bring upon ourselves because of our sins, but it's on good news. For isn't it striking how much of our text deals with the delivery of the message to King David? One-third of our reading, 13 out of 33 verses, deals with delivering of the message to King David. And the word used here repeatedly, even eight times, is a rendering of the Hebrew term meaning good news. Now this word good news in the Greek New Testament is a reference to the proclamation of the gospel and the victory over sin, Satan, and death obtained in the shed blood of Christ on the cross. Now the good news which Ahimeas wanted to proclaim to David was that God had given him the victory by defeating the army of Absalom and by Absalom's death. But the problem was that David was not inclined to accept this as good news. Good news for David was that Absalom was still alive. Good news for every other man involved in the war with Absalom and his men that day was that Absalom's army had been defeated and that the troublemaker had been removed. And indeed, it can be asked, how could David receive the death of a son as good news? How could any parent receive the good news of Jesus Christ as good news? Well, there is good news in it, brothers and sisters. For through the bitterness of our own sin, we may see the light of salvation. And that light is that as we bitterly grieve over the spiritual struggle of some of our children, we become increasingly more aware and more remorseful of our own sins and weaknesses. And we become increasingly aware of our hopelessness and our helplessness. Our sins and our weaknesses works against us, even in our best efforts in raising our children to the love of the Lord. But then, brothers and sisters, we can fall on our knees before our Heavenly Father and pray. A Father father unto us who will never leave us, who will never fail us, who loves us with a far deeper and purer love than we can ever have for our children. It will be another son of David who is at the same time the true Son of God, indeed our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That is good news for us, brothers and sisters. David, in his somewhat twisted love, had more love for his one rebellious son, Absalom, than for all the people of Israel who obediently fought for the king. But our Father in heaven had more love for thousands of us rebellious people than for his one and only son, Jesus Christ. Our Father in heaven has more love for us fathers and mothers, though we raise our children, his children, in weaknesses and shortcomings than he had for his one and only son and allowed him and him alone to die that he cursed death on the cross instead of all of us. Praise God. We should know too that David, after his first son's death, still had God's grace and and mercy in perspective. For he said after the baby died, he said, I will go to him, but he will not return to me. But after Amnon died, and particularly after Absalom died, David lost all perspective. Indeed, it is difficult when a little baby dies, but it's so much harder when a grown son or daughter dies, one with whom you had personal bonding for so many years. Understandably, David was overwhelmed with grief. David was a broken man. And yet, brothers and sisters, David was a child of the Lord. And so while disciplining his child with hard measures, the Lord also worked the joy of salvation in his heart, the knowledge of the forgiveness of sins and weaknesses. And so we can later hear that in so many of David's psalms, 
Listen to Psalm 30, 32. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord. Rejoice, you righteous. Shout for joy, all you upright in heart. In Psalm 51, David confesses the sacrifice of God, our broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O God, you will not despise. Do good to Zion in your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. And so David learned two most important things. Number one, personal confession of sin and weaknesses in all humility. And secondly, a focus foremost on the well-being of Zion and God's people, Jerusalem, the church. Yes, David knew his sins forgiven. Even though he must feel that bitter pain and consequence of a sin for the rest of his life, he knew his sins forgiven. And that is no less true for us, brothers and sisters. When your children go astray, it may be related to a particular aspect of your life, or it may not be. But it's hard for a parent not to blame himself or herself for the waywardness of their children. Parents always have the inclination to ask, where did I go wrong? What could I have done differently? In hindsight, you may well have done things differently. But some things cannot be undone. Sin, once committed, cannot be undone. It can only be washed away. It can only be covered in the blood of Christ. And so, brothers and sisters, don't be like David. Don't be like David, who was unable to receive good news the day the Lord delivered David and his people from evil. But receive good news that your sins, your weaknesses are forgiven in Jesus Christ, also in the raising of our children when you come before him with a sincere heart, seeking his forgiveness, he will then give you peace. He will yet give you joy through sorrow. Believe it with all your heart. He will give that to you, all because he loved not his son more than all of us, but gave him up for us all, that we might have life, and have life abundantly. Amen.